spreading. <laughs> so, as I said, good morning and thanks for coming along uh, today to our cooperation projects application workshop. Um, many of you might have been at the uh, session we did before Christmas, just more of an overview of the, uh, the, the funding project for the projects itself, um, and this is more in detail for the application process, um, and so myself and Katie will be splitting it up in throughout the, the uh, presentation today, looking at the different areas of work that you will have to do should you undertake um, this quest. Uh, so, as per usual, my thing isn't even sharing or right, going forward, Katie. Anyway, so I'll start off. So, myself and Katie, as you may know, we work uh, in the culture office. Um, we both kind of head up the culture office and its activities uh, on a yearly program. Uh, we wor work in consultation and kind of directly with our uh, counterparts in the media. Um, office. So there's two media offices, one in Dublin and one in Galway, um, and we're kind of more uh, consistently working with them on joint uh, events throughout the year. Um, I'm actually going to, just as we um, continue to talk, but I'll stop sharing for a second because it's not going forward. Uh, do you want me to share? Yeah, if you could, yeah. that'd be great. Sorry, anyway. This is kind of our thing, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and every and my dog, of course. Um, yeah. it's kind of like it's a, it's a full event, let's say. Yeah. It's a circus. Full, full experience. Um, so the running order today, we're we're going to introduce as I am at the moment. Um, we'll go into more an overview of the cooperation projects, um, what they kind of cover and and how you might be looking at applying in, in whatever capacity you are yourselves. Um, and then we'll go directly into the application process. And as I said, there'll be questions at the end. Um, so as I said, we're the culture office, myself and Katie, um, and throughout the year, we roll out a program of events, um, which look at uh, promoting the program um, locally, regionally, and at a national level. And these will be around all the different calls that come out and kind of punctuate the year. So each call we will do like this, we'll do application process or overview um, events to look more in detail at the program or the calls themselves. Um, so as I said, we work collaboratively with our um, other counterparts in the media desks, um, but we also work with other agencies, stakeholders across um, Ireland and internationally. Um, and we work with our Creative Europe Desk Network, and that is um, including 40 desks across Europe. So um, we kind of share other intel, uh, which will be coming from other um, European countries around how they do it or projects that have been developed in their countries. Um, we also assist with partner researches, um, re our requests with um, potential for potential applicants. Um, so if you if you are indeed in that situation then obviously get in touch with us around that um and then we develop cross sectoral partnerships um as i said with the media program um throughout the year um so to look more broadly at why the eu european union funds culture um directly it has intrinsic value to uh create the european union um as a project itself they want to um integrate culture as part of social activity um, within the European Union. And so this has a, a direct result um, and a value for the social, the project of the European Union itself. Um, the treaty commitments over the last um, decades feed into kind of broader EU policy. Um, and then those policy documents coming out like the Agenda for Culture 2018 has been updated now as the work plan for culture 2019 to 22. And as you see there, other documents, gender equality strategy, uh, the European Green Deal, we all know that that's has a huge impact now on the program itself um, and the framework for action on cultural heritage. So obviously we say you don't necessarily have to read all these documents, um, but just being aware of them and their kind of importance to the overall program itself. Um, and those priorities that come out of them is, is one to, to uh, understand a little bit. 
Um, and then next, so there we go with the priorities. So they do, do come, they are fed through with those um, other strategy uh, documents, as we just mentioned, but also as we are in the middle of a kind of still a post COVID um, era, we're looking at resilience and recovery coming out of that for the sectors. Um, and then other priorities are innovation and joint creation. We'll see that in um, the cooperation projects, the uh, priorities themselves, um, cooperation and exchange of practices, capacity buildings, uh, building of artists as always, that's kind of a mainstay um, in culture and key players and multipliers and how these um, funding programs can have that impact on key players and multipliers nationally. Um, so, so to look more closely at the cross-cutting priorities, so these are across all the program um, of Creative Europe, um, and they need to be addressed by every kind of application, every project. And what they are looking at is inclusion, diversity and gender, environment and the fight against climate change. So they're the two key cross-cutting priorities. Um, and within your project, you should explain what part of the project design and its implementation. So how are you rolling out um, your program with those uh, cross-cutting uh, cross priorities in mind? Um, Sorry, Aoife, just yeah. to interrupt, um, everything just kind of shut down for me for a second. So I'm just resharing. Okay. Yeah, we're just going with the flow. Um, <laughs> So yeah, technical issues aside, including the management, as I was just saying, the implementation. So it's key as we might, we'll be, we will be showing you kind of how us as a desk, we apply um, to the Creative Europe program ourselves. So we have kind of direct um, experience of how these um, priorities work in the sense that when you are designing your project, and the management of it, um, and then kind of the artistic parts, the artistic elements. How do um, how does inclusion, diversity, and gender look within that project? And how does how are you approaching um, the the crisis, the, the environmental crisis, and climate change? And um, so you kind of you can look into the section two of the uh, call document where there's examples of those kind of activities and how you can implement and manage. Um, and roll out your project with those uh, cross-cutting priorities in mind. Um, thanks, Katie. So Creative Europe 2023, as I said, there are these ongoing kind of issues at the moment. There's a con complex context of the war in Ukraine added to um, the kind of fall of, out of that, obviously, and how that has impacted the creative and culture sectors of Ukraine. Um, and then COVID recovery again, and um, we're kind of still in that uh, recovery era. Um, and then on top of that, the energy crisis and climate change. So there's a lot going on um, in the background of this new program. And I guess in, in that kind of way, there is a larger budget um, because there's a lot more to kind of um, to take on board. They're asking a lot more in the sense that, as we just said, the projects have to come back from, they were coming back from COVID, they're recovering from the COVID, um, the impact of COVID, but they're also looking at um, other crises and how to manage that. The other reason for a larger budget is that there was a huge amount of applications um, in and around 40% extra applied to cooperation projects in the last call. Um, so they've really upped the, the, the budget. So that's it's a good positive slant on going forward, going towards your application. Um, as I said, yeah, continued direct response to COVID. Um, and there's additionally to this is another one that you could be using depending on whether you, you kind of apply to cooperation projects or not, but the Culture Moves Europe new award, funding award is a great additional kind of uh, application um, you could try for in, in the hopes potentially um, as part of your project, but maybe in the hopes of developing um, partnerships going forward in Europe. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Katie. Thanks, Aoife. Um, just to say on the last slide, I guess probably, um, the European Year of Youth was left in there. Um, 2022 was the European Year of Youth. 
So um, it's just an important reminder if there's any kind of legacy activities that your project might have uh, coming out of that, uh, don't forget to, to mention those. Um, so we're just going to go in now to the kind of nuts and bolts, and we're going to talk about the cooperation project strand, which are all hopefully uh, planning applications under. Um, so really, this is the main uh, funding strand of Creative Europe, and it's always a really exciting uh, time for us when we see this deadline coming up. So just kind of some general overview, sorry, just my dog, um, of the strand. Um, there's three strands which we'll go into. You cannot apply uh, with the same project under more than one strand in any uh, year. Projects last uh, generally, there's no minimum, but they'll generally last between uh, 12 to 18 months and four years. Um, these, unlike some other European funds that you uh, you might be you know, familiar with, this is actually pre-financing. So you'll receive a chunk of your grant at the start of your project. Um, for a small and medium scale, you'll have two payments, I guess. So you'll receive 80% of your grant uh, at the beginning and you'll receive 20% at the end. For the large scale projects, um, there generally be an interim payment. So it, it's usually um, across maybe three payments and you'll receive 40% of the, the grant at the beginning. So let's look at a cooperation project strand. As many of you are aware, um, in the previous program, there were only two strands, small and large, and now they have introduced a medium strand. So the other thing that's very exciting is, um, and which some of the smaller countries fought for, is that especially the small strand, there is a ring fence budget for it. And that's really good news uh, for Ireland. So the small strand will represent 35% of the um, of the budget, um, it will require a minimum of three partners from three different European countries, and it will offer grants of up to a maximum of 200,000, and that can represent 80% of your budget, meaning uh, the partners will have to raise 20% of the budget through national avenues. The new strand, which is actually uh, probably one of the most oversubscribed, it's the most popular, will be the medium strand. And again, there's 35% of the budget ring fence for this strand. It will require a minimum of five partners from five different European countries, and it will offer grants of up to a maximum of one million, and that can represent 70% of your total budget, which is fantastic. The last one is very large scale, um, so this would be 30% uh, of the European budget is ring fence for this strand, and you will need to have a minimum of 10 partners from 10 different countries and grants are offered up to a maximum of 2 million or 60% of the total budget. So just again, looking at the budget, um, and I should say, um, as Eva mentioned, the budget is 60 million, 20% will be ring fenced for uh, sector specific uh, priorities, which we'll go into. And this breaks down to 21 million for small scale, 21 million for medium scale, and 18 million for the large scale. So who can apply? Most of you are probably aware. It's very broad who can apply. Individuals are not eligible to apply, though, of course, um, they're beneficiaries of this funding um, in a very large way through the projects themselves. So you must have a legal entity. Um, you can be um, any really type of uh, NGO or for profit, a cultural institution, museums, arts and culture organizations. You need to be operating in one of the participating program countries. There's 40 at the moment. Um, and again, you have to form part of a partnership of either three, five or 10 partners from different countries. If you are the uh, coordinator, so the, the lead partner, you need to have a demonstrate that you've been in existence for at least two years on the date of the deadline. This does not um, apply to partners, which is good news. Um, just one sec, I'm gonna see if I can get this dog quiet for a sec. Just if anyone would like a dog, there is one available in Bray at the moment. Um, so the other thing is you must have sufficient financial and operational capacity. Now this can act as kind of a, like a red flag for people, but really this is really about that you have a demonstrable track record in delivering the types of activities that you're applying to deliver and the scale of activities that you're trying to deliver. So I know everyone here today 
you, you will meet that, you know what I mean? Because you, you all have experience, you know, in delivering to a very high standard, what you're most likely applying to deliver. Um, so we can kind of answer any questions on that, but it, it's really just to say, to remember that this is about your, your track record and your experience. Um, so it's kind of, um, and again, it's proportionate. So if you're applying as the lead for a 4 million euro project, they're going to look very closely at your financial capacity. If you're applying as a partner under a small scale, it's, it's less of an issue. Um, so just quickly to look at the timetable. And again, after a little bit of kind of uh, anomaly in the first year, because it started late, we're back to the kind of annual deadlines, which should hopefully happen roughly around this time every year. So the deadline is the 23rd of uh, February at a 4 p.m. Irish time. Obviously, we'd like to see everyone putting their applications well in advance of that. The evaluation period will take place from March and uh, to July, and you should hopefully be um, you should hopefully be notified by the end of July. The process is slightly different now, which we'll go into where there's kind of a longer process because there's no audit based uh, reporting. It's it's a, a different model. The process of, uh, you know, essentially agreeing your contract might take a bit longer that could take up until October. Um, and at which point, if you are based here and you're an art or arts or cultural organization, you are eligible to apply for the Arts Council's Creative Europe co-fund, which should have a deadline every year in December. And we can talk more about that later. So let's look then. Um, obviously, as many of you are aware, this program is structured around um, you will need to kind of frame your project within very specific objectives and priorities. Um, there, um, for um, objectives, you must select one. So you must select either creation, which will mean your project uh, demonstrates, you know, that you strengthen the transnational creation and circulation of European works and artists. So this is kind of the classic cooperation project built around you know, maybe kind of platforming or performance more. Um, and then we have innovation. So your project will enhance the capacity of European culture and creative sectors to nurture talents, innovate, prosper, and generate jobs and growth. So one of the things I think that's really a strength about uh, cooperation projects, along with the fact that you're, you're kind of securing multi-annual uh, funding, which is very diff difficult, if impossible to get in a lot of countries, um, it's very broad what you can do. Yes, these are artistic um, projects, but it, it's actually broader than that. And you're looking at projects that can actually develop, uh, you know, models or ways to improve, uh, improve sectors and improve your work. So projects will often, you know, identify a possible barrier uh, for your sector and you can, uh, you can develop a project, you know, through uh, professional development, through training, through research. So, you know, it's very broad and you might find that your project is more suited under the innovation. So then once you've selected your objectives, um, you're gonna look really um, at probably, um, it's really kind of two, you, uh, you know, personally, I think, you know, if you're kind of going more than uh, two priorities, you might kind of find it a bit more difficult to kind of um, address them all to a sufficient level, but it's certainly um, it's certainly up to yourselves. But you're going to select um, you're going to select around two of these. So the first one is audience because it's important to remember, you know, that these projects uh, for the EU operate as kind of conduits or gateways to. The citizens of Europe to the people that um, the EU really want to reach with its funding. So um, audience is asking that your project increases cultural access and develops engagement across a broad range of uh, audience groups. Uh, social inclusion, very, very strong. And you saw that through the horizontal priorities. And I think this is where Irish projects, there is a real um, I guess, kind of body of work or history of this kind of work within the art sector here. So this is a really interesting one, social inclusion. So these are projects for or of, or I would say by uh, marginalized groups um, and projects that promote intercultural dialogue. Again, very, very strong priority in this program. So as Aoife said, 
well, every project will need to show that it's considering, uh, you know, kind of uh, the climate crisis within its work. It might be the main focus of your project where um, it can be. So you might select sustainability. So projects that will contribute to the European Green Deal. So we've seen a number of these projects already um, looking to kind of maybe assist uh, certain sectors. Certainly there's been very strong uh, festivals projects in this way. You know, how do we promote uh, sustainable tourism or sustainable festivals, for instance? But again, uh, that's, that's a specific priority, even if you have to address it in some way. Um, again, uh, new technology in the former program, this was probably more uh, structured as new business models, but this is um, enabling the understanding that the cultural and creative sectors are operating in a really challenging you know, space, especially in the case of certain sectors like say music, um, and your project might be seeking to increase uh, your specific sector's competi competitiveness in a global uh, environment or global market. Um, international uh, dimension, this is quite interesting, but it might be uh, your project is helping to build capacity for your sector or for artists to be active and kind of thrive at international level. And again, as we mentioned, that kind of 20% ring fencing, your project might uh, come under a sector specific priority, such as kind of literature, music, architecture, cultural heritage. And some new additions here would be uh, fashion and design and uh, sustainable cultural tourism. Again, that last one, very relevant for uh, the heritage sectors in particular. So I think I'm handing over to Aoife now. Am I? Yeah. Right? Okay, great. Hi. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, to go more into the nitty gritty, the award criteria is divided into four different main areas. So relevance, um, giving 30 points there and the relevance of your uh, project in relation to what we've discussed. So in relation to the, the overall uh, objectives and priorities. Um, the quality of content and activities. So how have you devised um, the actual program, the, the artistic activities and the content um, of the project. Um, so really, again, 30. So the, the top two, the relevance and the quality of your content and activities take the kind of higher amount of points there. Um, and then the project management having 20 points. Um, yeah, really around the whole management of the project, which is kind of obvious. Um, but it is not to be kind of uh, sniffed at because obviously if you're doing um, you know, your various work packages, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, there is a whole project management around, you know, four, at least four work packages. Um, so, so to really to be able to go into detail um, around how you will be managing um, those. Uh, dissemination, we're going to look a little bit in a while about feedback and dissemination has come up quite a few times, quite a lot of times in the feedback of uh, the evaluation of projects. Um, so really dissemination is a very important part of the, your application. Um, so to put the work into that area because they really, really, the agency wants you to be able to uh, disseminate your project throughout the course of the of the project um, but also in the aftermath and how uh, you plan to do that is important and um, so overall there's a maximum of 100 points um, so the threshold for funding is set at a minimum of 70 out of 100 um, and more than 50 percent of the maximum score under each category so it's, it's quite particular um, and even though the, the the weighting is different i would say generally kind of put all your effort into all of them equally just you know to make sure that you're um you're going to you get a, get your points across all, all four areas um and the next so relevance yeah so as i said is it relevant to the objectives and the priority of the call um so looking at the call documents there and going into the detail of what uh, cooperation projects means and what they are looking for and how you're kind of matching those um, relevantly. Uh, is it based on sound and adequate needs analysis? So as Katie said, um, it, within your sector, is there 
uh, you know, is there a barrier in the sector? Is there a need to be for this to be addressed um, nationally? And then again, with your partners internationally, because um, as we find uh, sectors across Europe uh, could easily be or might more than likely be facing the same kind of barriers um, in, the, in their uh, countries. Um, does it address the cross-cutting issues, as we mentioned, inclusiveness, gender equality, um, and the environmental impact? Um, and has it got European added value um, in general? So does your, um, you know, the reason why you're applying to a Creative Europe um, uh, fund is, is it, does it have European added value? Does it have an international um, value to it? Um, and to really think about those um, areas of relevance, because if not, you, you wouldn't be kind of applying to Europe, otherwise you'd be applying nationally. Um, and so it does, it does you, you do have to be able to kind of articulate that. Um, and the next slide, thanks Katie. So in, as I said, in, in um, we have been able to source the feedback from various evaluations over the, the last few calls. Um, and what they're saying is, that uh, audience development strategy does not include specific tools or channels. So this is within the relevance. So that you know, if you're looking at the area of, of audience development, um, then you, you must have a strategy for that particular audience that you want to reach. And, and what are the, your kind of tools? What are your ways of, of doing reaching that through the strategy, reaching that audience? Um, methodology of workshops not explained, lack of, lack of concrete information on which bands um, will travel where. So they're kind of more artistic details, I suppose, um, you know, that there's a lack of information. Um, and is it re relevant to transnational mobility, but not enough detail on and not substantiated? So, yeah, there is, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to... Um, you're trying to make sure that you're relevant to the objectives and priorities, um, but you do need to also be specific about those details and, and try and kind of not to say give too much information, but definitely give um, enough that makes it um, feasible and relevant. Um, and the bottom four pieces here in blue um, are the positives. So strategy clearly formulated for, for each priority. The project goes beyond sole interests of the partners. So there, it's kind of like your, your A pluses there um, in, in, the, in the blue um, the, the blue text. Um, so the next page, Katie, thanks. The quality of content and activities. So as I said at the beginning, these are a bit more top loaded with um, 30 points in, uh, in the overall evaluation. Um, the proposed methodologies are appropriate for achieving the pro project's uh, objectives. So yeah, the, the activities and the, your kind of approach um, is appropriate for, for the objectives of what you want to achieve um, with the project. And the project should involve an appropriate mix of participating organizations in terms of pro profile and expertise and ensures an active contribution of them all. Um, so the target groups will benefit concretely from the project. So if you're, your quality and content of activities um, for your specific sector and you're looking at a mix of appropriate organizations with different experience and expertise um, but the you know so you could be reaching that and then you're leaving out maybe your target groups and how they will benefit from the project so kind of it's all, it's almost like telling the whole story that that those target group groups are as important as the overall project and how are you going to bring the project to them? Um, so it is all around the, the project design, as they say, they say here that uh, it needs to be coherent, notably with a pro good proposal and timeline. Um, and if we move down, we, we'll see what the feedback is um, over the next, uh, I have it here. Um, yeah, so the feedback is, so there was, uh, in the in the not great um, responses where there was no clear um, explanation of the Im implementation of each activity, a lack of methodology. So there again, um, the methodology of your activities and um, how they're going to be rolled out needs to be really 
drilled down into and how the activities relate to the target groups, as we said, um, there's not an explained sufficiency how the outreach work will ha um, have a lasting impact. So there again, that's kind of the kind of full story, the full impact of your project. You need to sufficiently kind of plan all of those elements. If you have an outreach element, if you're reaching certain target audience, um, and then here, a lack of selection criteria for involved art artists. So that's important as well. You know, kind of how have you, how have you decided upon or how will you decide upon the artists um, you will be working with or selecting. Um, and then the, the A plus is again, a very meticulous, well-structured and defined activities. Target groups were related to specific activities. So that's kind of matching the two areas of work um, there um, with your target groups and very clear and concrete activities, including training program and community toolkits structured in the work packages. So there, again, for your outreach, um, concrete activities, a training program and a community toolkit. So it's kind of, yeah, I mean, these are really useful, I think, in terms of plan, you know, unpacking it really and the areas that they are literally looking for you to uh, fill in those gaps, how your project is going to be rolled out, how it will meet those target groups, how it will have a methodology in, in being implemented. Um, and we'll go on to the next bit of feedback. So again, the project management, um, what we find again here is there are areas like the mechanisms for coordinations between coordination between the participating organizations. Um, and this is key, you know, around um, your meetings, your uh, first of all, yeah, your meetings throughout the, the project. How are you going to decide on things? How are you going to coordinate? Who who's taking up what work package and all of that? Um, but also there, the proposals on appropriate governance structure. So um, including the, the communication within consortium. And these are all really important to actually, for your own work, is to actually iron them out anyway at the beginning of the project. Because uh, as we know, you get into a project and it's so busy and there's lots of stuff going on. But like if you have your resources and your communication and your um, kind of team sorted out, uh, from the very beginning, um, it does help in the long run. Um, so it's kind of good in a way. It's making you get even more organized at the application stage. And then if you kind of follow that going forward, um, it should all be great. Um, so the, the feedback on the man project management. Um, oh, this continues. Sorry. So the uh, project budget is cost effective and allocates appropriate resources to each activity. Um, yeah, so they do look for best value for money, but at the same time, um, as with, we know, Arts Council funding as well, you do need to play, pay artists well, you need to budget properly for, um, for other uh, costs within the rollout of your project. So it has to be sufficient and appropriate um, while trying to get best, best value for money. So it's a bit of a balancing project there with the budget. Um, the measures plan to ensure project implementation are of high quality, you're including management, um, risk man management, quality control, planning, monitoring, and evaluation. So yeah, I mean, it, you, as organizers, organizations working anyway, you know about management and you know about um, your monitoring and evaluation, but there's probably a little bit more detail in risk management, being able to kind of highlight um, or quantify qualify what what is risk management for the project um, and quality control kind of overall over the whole course of the project um, so these are areas that you might need to do a little bit of kind of thinking about definitely and maybe reading around the best way to achieve or to plan for uh, those kind of management areas of management um, and the feedback so yeah kind of as part of the quality of partnership and management um, so some areas to, that weren't so uh, successful is no concrete examples of how the partnership will last beyond the project. Um, 
yeah, so this is important to think through that um, the kind of the impact of the project, the, the longevity of it, um, the partnership limited was limited geographically and does not go beyond neighboring countries. So again, to think through um, not to be maybe so centric or to take in other um, neighboring countries uh, as a part as a potential partner. Um, the majority of the budget goes to the lead partner, therefore no strong involvement of par partners. Um, and that sounds very obvious, but that makes a lot of sense that you spread your uh, implementation across the partners and that the, the budget is allocated sufficiently for that. Um, otherwise, it just doesn't seem like a very wholesome kind of project um, and something that will be have impact in those um, sectors in those countries as well. Um, so the positive kind of outcomes of feedback are emerged from the project application emerged from former collaboration a partnership was inter had was interesting and very clear concrete functions for each partner so that's kind of how it works there where the partnership had their own um, kind of work packages and it was very obvious and concrete. Uh, the partnership is underpinned in a guiding principles document, so that's one to consider, and um, that will lead to a shared understanding of the project's underlying principles and language. So, yeah, that's a more kind of positive way um, of looking at your uh, management with a guiding principle document, potentially. Um, and the next dissemination. So as we, I said earlier, dissemination is a very important part of uh, the project. Um, and it is something that you'll see in the feedback here that is people kind of seem to leave to the last minute and it does end up being quite a bit of body of work um, and it's, but very, very worthwhile um, to get your strategy around your dissemination and your communication. Um, so yeah, here they're saying that the, the, those strategies have the potential to reach and positively impact the target groups and participating organizations as well as the wider community. So yes, if you're if you really drill down into your strategy, you can kind of outline how you're going to do, um, how you're going to have that impact. The project proposal includes concrete and effective steps to ensure the sustainability of the project its capacity to continue having an impact and producing results after the end of the action. So this is really important as well, because as we know, some parts of long, longer projects, uh, the, the program might not ha um, happen till the very end of the project. And you have to have a plan in place there for your for ongoing dissemination of those successes and those, those stories after the project um, finishes. Um, and then we'll go on to um, the next. Thanks, Katie. Um, so yeah, the dissemination, the negative um, piece of, of feedback are that there was no evidence in the project of how the EU support will be made clearly visible. So that's really important. How are you going to show that Creative Europe are, are co-funders of your project? Um, communication strategy is too vague the limited budget allocation. So again, make it feasible for your communication to have enough costs um, within the budget um, and with enough money. Plans to attract large numbers, but insufficient evidence to do this. So there you go. You know, you just, if you have ambitious plans about your project and how it's going to be disseminated, you, then you have to have, you know, the plan, the, the evidence to show how you're going to do this. Um, and the positives, collaborative communication strategy, well-described tools, precise to plans of media and marketing corresponding to needs of target group. Um, so yeah, that make, made, you know, that was a positive plan around the dissemination there with their media and marketing. Um, so yeah, I suppose the, the, the real thing is just to put the time into it. Um, yeah, we can move on. Sorry, Katie, I'm just chatting on. Um, and to make it a key part of your overall planning for the project. Um, so looking at the cross-cutting priorities, as we mentioned them, in inclusion, diversity and gender, environment and the fight against climate change. Um, increasingly, now this, this feedback here in particular is from Cooperation Projects 2021, um, but increasingly uh, this is of, of a core importance to your whole project. So um, it kind of, I'm sure there will be, other feedback coming out of this year. 
um, but it does point out that projects should explain what in the project design and its implementation is looking at environmental sustainability and how they will ensure gender balance inclusion that can be a focus with them and their partners and how they plan to work it in with the partners. Um, so attention to coherence between different parts of the application. Um, yeah, so kind of joining the dots so that you don't focus um, these cross-cutting priorities just in one area of your or one pack work package um, as such, um, so that it, it kind of cross-references across your application. Um, and then there is a strategy to be explained in part 1.4. So within the, the, the um, application, the part A um, looks at that. So there, there are questions within the application that will kind of ask you about what is your strategy around these cross-cutting priorities. And that's where you clearly explain um, throughout the partnership, this is how you're going to approach um, these areas within your, the implementation of the project. Um, the next, and yeah, so I think I'm going to hand you back over to Katie. Um, thanks, Ethan. Thanks. Uh, for all the heavy lifting there. It's fantastic. Um, so yeah, we are, we are going to send this all out after, so it will be hopefully a useful uh, tool, because I know it's a lot of uh, information to take in. Just like one kind of quick overview thing to kind of always have in your mind is kind of remember that in 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 a way under that wide eu funds culture is it's really kind of this like it's a hearts and mind exercise it's a tool to achieve their kind of social and uh, political aims so you need to have that in your head you know kind of at all times and you'll see you know a lot of uh when you read through the feedback especially to do with um communication and dissemination that you can see some applications forget that. I think everyone, we're all focused on, you know, that kind of the, the artistic elements, making sure everyone gets paid, making sure a schedule is feasible, you know, all of that, but just really spend the time and kind of resource appropriately those activities around kind of outreach and communication and dissemination. Um, but I'm just gonna start on the application process itself. Um, and I should say to start off, we'll just go through the number of um, uh, documents that you'll need to, to reference. So obviously the main one, uh, the guidelines uh, per se, will be the call document. Um, I'll send out a, a WeTransfer link with all of them if, if you haven't yet gone into the, the portal and downloaded everything, which you probably should have, um, but I'll send them all out so you have them. So we have the call document. And that's going to give you a lot of um, stuff that we've covered today, the, the background objectives, scope activities. Um, it will give you the timetable and budget um, and all of stuff like general guidelines around kind of eligibility and criteria. I'll also include uh, just for reference, I'm not sure it's mentioned here, um, each year the EU has to get its annual work program um, agreed. Um, before they can then uh, draft uh, call documents or open funding. So I'll, I'll include that as well. And that can be a, a handy reference. I think overall, as Aoife was saying earlier, the I kind of overarching context to 2023 in this call will be obviously, um, you know, the kind of a number of global crises that are, are ongoing. So your project and your application exists within those, as Eva was saying, legacy to COVID, um, the war on Ukraine, uh, the financial uh, crisis, the energy crisis. So you'll kind of see some of those things coming in the, the work program for 2023. And kind of when you're, you're framing your application, you're kind of demonstrating that you are kind of responding to those in some way. Um, so uh, there's also um, the online uh, manual. So this year, as I'm not sure um, all of you are aware, everything is standardized and comes through an online, um, it's called the Funding and Tenders Portal. And there's a, a manual, a really handy manual that will kind of go through the procedures to register and submit proposals um, online. Um, so that, that's one to kind of have at hand. The other thing, and this is kind of confusing, will be the, the model grant agreement. Um, so you will have to kind of cross check that with the guidelines um, because there'll be a lot of um, information in there that you might need to reference. 
Um, so this is a really uh, one you'll need to have to hand as well. Um, so this will kind of um, have a lot of the information related to kind of cost eligibilities and, and all of that. So that's another one to have to hand. But again, we'll send that out um, after today. Uh, so where to start? If you haven't done this already, many of you will already have um, a, personal identification, a personal identification, a PIC code, um, and you, you should be registered on the funding and tenders portal. If you're not, uh, you need to do that right now. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, there's a really useful, and we have the link here, uh, European Commission webinar on how to do this. So I would... Um, I would suggest if you have any questions, having a look at that. Um, everyone involved um, we, in your project will need to have a pick. So if you are the lead and you have a number of partners, you know, check that today, you know, just double check. Um, because even within there, you want them to check that all the contact details are right, that the, you know, all of that is kind of up to date. Um, so really that's something to kind of check today with obviously yourself, but also any of the, the partners or people involved. Um, you'll need to find the call. So um, again, um, I'm not screen sharing because we're having uh, loads of technical issues, but essentially the homepage of the Funding and Tenders portal, you'll be able to search for the call um, and kind of filter. So you filter through the Creative Europe and then you find uh, the call you want and you can start. So you'll see um, I've just um, included this because there's also the one thing that is quite good about the portal is um, all kind of support and, and contact comes through there. So you really, everything really is in, in one place. So you'll see here, um, this is the homepage of the Funding and Tenders portal and you'll see a tab called support um, and you'll see a number of uh, questions and all of their kind of guidance documents and all of that along with the help desk are there. So I should say, um, you know, who to contact when you, come into any kind of issue. So Aoife and myself are there for, I guess, the, the content of uh, the application when you run into anything with, you know, questions about the application form or um, anything like that, you kind of come to the Creative Europe desk because then we can take your question directly to the, the commission and we have that facility. Um, if you have any kind of technical problem with the portal, we cannot help you with that because we don't have access. We are kind of an applicant to this portal as well. Obviously, you know, let us know and we might have come across a similar thing, but really to kind of, if you're running into any technical question, you need to use the, the help desk on the portal itself. So this is, again, just a, a screenshot for you. And you can see I had started a dummy one. This is from an old call. Um, but this is how you've kind of created your, your proposal. And then you'll see uh, part B templates are all the documents I was discussing. So you'll be able to find all the documents related to that call and you can kind of download them uh, right away. Um, this is just a few um, kind of things here around the different, um, the dip different uh, roles within your applicants. So um, applicants are called uh, beneficiaries. So this will be both the coordinator who acts as the administrative lead and the partners. It's important to say here that the EU and it should be considered that you are all equal creative partners within this. You might have different roles. You might have, some might have a, a larger role, but really calling someone a lead is about that they are the administrative kind of coordinator and lead because the EU will have contact with only one. So all contact, uh, once you're selected, has to go through pretty much the, the lead. They will administer the funding, but this is a creative partnership. And then there's something called affiliated entities. So you might have an organization that's involved in a, you know, a, a, a quite a large way, but they don't necessarily feel or they're not eligible to be um, a full partner and they'll be, um, they'll be an affiliated entity. Um, so the other way that this can work is some organizations, um, say the Goethe Institute um, has uh, entities. So there, there's kind of a mother organization and then there's entities in a lot of different countries and they might be involved, but they're not gonna sign the grant. So they're related to one of the beneficiaries. We also have associated partners, uh, subcontractors. This is really 
important, um, as many of you will kind of remember from the last, is you know you need to be kind of careful around subcontracting. What the EU don't want to see is that you as an organization get the grant and essentially the running of the project um, is subcontracted out to someone else. So if there is something within the project that it can be expected that you as an arts or culture organization can do, you've got to be really careful about kind of sending that out to someone else because the benefit of this project is yes to all the kind of artists and audiences involved, but it's also about you as an organization and you kind of developing, um, you know, and benefiting from the funding as well. So they don't want to see that going to someone else who they haven't, you know, kind of assessed um, and all of that. Um, so one way um, you can think about it is really just around uh, tasks that obviously cannot be implemented by yourself. Um, third parties, uh, this is a new term and in a way it kind of came in, uh, in the previous program, it was called third countries and third countries could participate up to 30% of your budget. Um, this is kind of probably in, in a lot of ways, a response and recognizing post Brexit that they had to structure it slightly different. So now, um, we have third parties and they can participate in projects um, you know, bearing their own uh, costs. They can also um, contribute in-kind contributions, um, and but they will not become a formal recipients of EU funding. So let's just quickly then go into what documents do you need to have? Um, so there are uh, two uh, documents, uh, or there is part A, which is online. It's filled out directly online. Um, and then uh, you have part B. So this is your um, this is your application form, and this will need to be downloaded. Um, and again, uploaded as a PDF. So it's downloaded as a word, I think, and then uploaded as a PDF. Um, there's some additional uh, project data um, that again will be filled out online. And then there are two annexes that need to be um, uploaded with your application. There's a detailed budget table. So you must submit your budget in, uh, in this table. Um, I'll go through the, the formats and all of that in a bit. Um, and then there's also another template, which is a list of previous projects. So you will have essentially three uh, things to upload, uh, which are your application form, your budget and list of previous projects and the rest is filled out online. Um, so the other thing that was kind of different about this is the EU is trying to reduce, um, I guess, the, the amount of documentation uh, that's uploaded. Uh, so now in the previous program, you needed to have um, essentially a declaration of honor from all the partners mandating um, mandating that the, the lead can act on behalf of everyone. That now is only in the case of if you're successful. There's also... Um, I think there was additional documents around kind of financial uh, capacity. Um, and again, that will only be if you're successful and you're contacted. So what we've listed there is everything that you upload. Um, so the application form, um, again, uh, this is where you include uh, your kind of project uh, description and you select your priority. So it's very, um, I think it's quite straightforward, but again, uh, we're here, um, we're here to kind of help you with that. Um, and again, the just to kind of note that the budget itself will be um, completed after you've defined uh, the work packages, work packages in your your budget table. Um, so let's just go through. So sorry, that was the the online part A. So part B is your application form. And this is really where you need to spend the time um, as Aoife went through um, showing how you are addressing uh, the, the priorities. So this is really where you kind of spend your time. It's not necessarily a huge amount, like you're not in the, the previous program you were having, people were having you know 70 or 80 pages worth of stuff. This isn't about that. This is just about you, you know, kind of, being really clear with your kind of methodology and clear with your detail of how you're addressing each of these. Um, so again, we're here, um, we're here to kind of take you through that. I think the best thing to do, you know, after today 
is to kind of and again if if you're the lead it's also about looking and seeing you know we're going to go into the work packages and show you need to define who's responsible for for what but it's also about kind of creating you know delegating who can help with what you know within the application because it's a lot of uh, work, you know, in terms of like, you're going to want to make sure everyone has fed in, everyone has a, had a chance to read everything, but also defining who can uh, contribute what to the application itself. See this as a, as a mini project in itself. Um, I think I'm coming. Is that you now, if I can't remember, are you coming in? Yeah. Now? Yeah. Oh. Hello. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, the work packages themselves, um, we will see that they recommend um, a minimum of four um, work packages and you can have additional ones. It is up to how you were um, defining your project. Um, but what we would say is, uh, sorry, it's a minimum of three. Um, but what we would say is don't overdo it. I mean, don't uh, we would advise don't add additional additional work packages um, clearly just because of the workload um, and kind of overstretching yourself um, when you could do, you know, a, a great quality work within smaller kind of um, work packages. So what we do is um, when you're looking at your application form, um, you will uh, fill out the management and the administration, the implementation and the communication and dissemination work packages. Um, so eligible costs and activities are grouped under these work packages. Also, as Katie just said, you ha have allocated a partner within the project to be detailed to uh, these work packages. And when you're filling out the application form, you will physically put their, um, you know, their name, uh, beside those, um, those uh, work packages, so they are responsible for it. Um, so it, because you, you break it down into the, these three main areas of work, it allows for a greater emphasis on kind of defined deliverables and outcomes. So it does help, even though, as Katie said, it's quite a lot of work in the, in the sense of um, kind of really defining and refining what work is per per package, um, but then it, it does help you organize the project into areas of work um, for the, the duration of the project, um, and that is easier in the long term uh, for the management of it. Um, so as we say, keep your minimum um, number down and it will make the budgeting and reporting simpler at the end. So the way it works is that when you apply, you um, you outline your work packages and the work within each one, um, and the activities will be be allocated for each work pa package and the deliverables. Um, so if you overshoot by the end of the year, you know, depending on things that happen throughout the year, um, you just don't want to be pushed um, to have a huge amount of um, events or projects to be finished by the end of the year and it, it can really kind of scupper you at the end so really think about it um, as a ma manageable areas of work so the lump sums are calculated per work packages and the balance will be paid when the work package is completed so this we kind of added in here that the pre-financing is still applying here so when you have um, your grant agreement agreed you will still get your pre-finance for whatever so 80 percent for the small um let's say 80 percent for the small application um for the uh, small sized um application um but then the, that final 20 percent will be paid when your work package is complete so the evaluator can see clearly that that piece of work has from beginning to end has been completed um, and that's how they evaluate um at the end um, you, through your reporting. So the next um, page there, thanks, Katie. Um, so overall, yeah, define your, your work packages and assign responsibility. As I said, for a coordinator will be responsible for the work package one. So that's the management of the whole project um, will be the, the work package one for the coordinator. Um, group your activities and costs around each work package. Um, and across partner and the 
project and the partners. So allocate them free. Just, I just said that. Um, define, define your outcomes and your deliverables. Um, so I would say define and refine. So just, again, don't overshoot on the deliverables. Make it feasible. Make it something that you can attain. Um, and you're not kind of scuppered at the end to try and finish um, an excess of deliverables. Um, um, I was just going to say, Aoife, remember, because we have to we have to do this exact same thing. And the first year we did it, we just had so, which we're kind of reporting on now, the first two years, we had so many deliverables and it was actually a nightmare, you know, yeah. whereas kind of the learning from that is keep them manageable, you know, because you're kind of, this is meant to be easier. So don't, you know, just don't give yourself more work than is actually necessary. That'd be my yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, it does, you know, when you're writing it, uh, this is what we found when you're writing the application, you can get very carried away because you, you like the project and you love the different elements of the project. Um, but it's to really think through those elements in terms of time and in terms of being able to achieve them. And at the end, you know, then as Katie said, you, we were scope, you know, you can be scuppered because you've way too many deliverables and it's not achievable. Um, now, we, we obviously we're not just full disclosure. We're not saying we didn't deliver on what we said, but it was it was kind of it was pretty much too much work in the end. So just be realistic, really. And um, so quality rather than quantity. Um, and so we can move on to. So, as I said, the management administration and coordination is work package one, and that would be for the work for the coordinator of the project. Um, so in this area of work, activities could be planning and preparation, meetings, evaluation, quality control, coordination activities, preparation of reports, and the deliverable. So you'll see this when you go into the application, they will, it's divided into the actual activities, and then what are the deliverables, what type of deliverables can be shown to prove that you have done the, this work. So the type of deliverable would be an agenda or a, of a meet, or minutes of meetings, evaluation or and or quality control reports, uh, conception planning reports, etc. And reports meaning a PDF, um, you know, so that you gather gather together all of your agendas uh, or minutes of meetings into one PDF, um, your quality control reports and your planning reports. And again, what I'd say here is when you have done your, your application um, or when you're doing your application um, that also be realistic here in, into how many planning meetings is conceivable throughout the year, um, how many uh, meetings, you know, other than planning. So just say event meetings that are particular to one event, what is conceivable and achievable. So be kind of, you know, strategic there as well, because um, at the end of the day, then that's reducing your, your deliverables, even though you're still carrying out and you're delivering on your on your events and your project. Um, again, we can move on to. So the next um, active or the next work package um, would be your implementation, your artistic activities. Um, so depending on who in the project is, is um, responsible for this work package. The activities in this area of work could be rehearsals, preparations, concerts, exhibitions, festivals. So it is obviously very artistic um, in the, uh, their activities. Um, and then how you would prove that these activities have taken place are the deliverables that you will show. And they could be schedule of planning of rehearsals, original creative works such as theatre pieces, songs, artworks. Um, technology based projects, so an app or something in, in that kind of realm, um, publications, exhibitions, um, the digi digitized material, etc. So they are all the, the types of proofs so that they're they are physical pieces that you can um, use to, to show that you've delivered those activities. Um, and the next. So again, the third work package. Um, could be capacity building for artists or and or audiences potentially um, activities in this uh, area could be artistic residence residencies uh, mentoring programs training courses master classes etc 
Um, and the deliverables, again, the proof to show that they uh, took place could be the schedule of uh, mentoring programs, evaluation of training courses, um, your travel documents, um, your presence list, so who attended um, those courses or their, those residencies. And they will be in documents to be uploaded as deliverables. So most likely PDFs of those programs, those schedules, et cetera. Um, and the next, um, so networking and knowledge sharing. So this could be an, an additional uh, work package. Um, so activities in the area of this work would be conferences, workshops, uh, study policy, studies, policy analysis, surveys, etc. cetera. Um, and again, to, to prove that they existed, um, you could have a, a program or an agenda of a conference, um, a conference conclusions, reports, analysis of surveys, uh, study papers, policy papers. Um, so again, they will be documents that will be made into PDFs and uploaded as your deliverable. And when you're filling out your application form, um, you will select what those deliverables will be. So you'll see that when you put in your activities, they will ask for what deliverable will coincide with that activity. Um, and the next um, page, thanks, Katie. Um, again, communication and dissemination. So this is a core work package. It is required. Um, so you will have a partner who is assigned this work package um, and those activities could be uh, communication dissemination campaigns, promotional events, production of communication dissemination material. Um, again, uh, yeah, it says here, so yeah, your campaign, your deliverable would be a strategy. So a communication plan and strategy. Um, you know, the plan, the, the, out, the overview of that and how it were, was planning to work across the project as a PDF, uh, your, your website. So um, using uh, photographs of your website, how it has worked across the program as a PDF, um, newsletters, publication, brochures, social media posts, banners, branding um, and PR press, etc. So they're all pretty straightforward as well as deliverables. Um, so you will you will outline which ones you're going to, uh, your activities will coincide with those deliverables. Um, okay, I'm handing you back over to Katie, tag team. Thanks, Sipa. Um, okay, so this, I promise we're in the final stretch now. So uh, we're just gonna go over uh, the, the budget a bit. Um, so the biggest news um, is that um, they have simplified the budget into what they're calling lump sums. So overall, um, if you deliver uh, what you said you would deliver, you like you will be paid your your full grant, and uh, there won't be any uh, financial reporting or audits. So that is fantastic news because that took a huge amount of time. And it was it was just probably a nightmare on both sides. So the advantages are the grant is linked to results. So if you deliver what's in the agreement, you will be paid. Um, it's based on your your own budget and work packages, and there's no audits. But um, a huge amount of planning needs to go into you know this before writing the application. Um, you'll need to now a lot of projects uh, did this anyway. Um, I remember, you know, from over the years, case study presentations, you could see it's there's something intuitive about structuring your work this way in terms of both kind of responsibilities and output. So um, some people probably are used to working in this way anyway, um, but you will need to start with the structure of work packages and kind of go from there. Um, so your budget will be, uh, there'll be a budget sheet, I'll show you this for each organization, which is then broken down per work package. So you'll need to kind of say have staff costs, but that in, in a lot of ways, a personnel cost will be broken down across uh, work packages. Um, so really, if you're kind of at the start now, when you're doing your, your project budgeting now, even maybe before you get to, um, you know, using the the EU's template, it's a good idea to start structuring your, your costs and activities in this way. Um, and again, uh, like was the case before, um, <clears throat> if you only implement part of your, uh, your grant, it may be reduced. 
because the EU is making um, a grant offer based on a percentage. So you get 200,000 and that represents 80% of your budget. If things aren't being achieved and um, suddenly that grant goes up to being, you know, kind of 90% of your budget, they'll reduce it down. Um, however, um, like before the, the kind of agency who managed this, they want to help you. They are actually, you know, lovely people, but as they say, they can't help you after the fact. So the other thing with this type of kind of structure for your project is you really need to be on top of kind of monitoring and evaluation. So if you see due to, you know, things outside of your control or the fact that you had written this application, you know, four years before maybe the last activities, if stuff needs to be amended, you let them know in advance and that is possible. So what are the eligible costs? So again, uh, there's quite a range of costs that are eligible. Uh, direct staff costs um, would be one, obviously a certain amount of subcontracting that you want to kind of keep an eye on, as I said before, um, and uh, essentially the main kind of probably one of the, the bulk is per, what they call purchase costs. So that would be travel accommodation and subsistence equipment um, so again it's not the purchase of equipment it's the depreciation costs and I think they have a sheet within or I know they have a sheet within the budget to help you with that calculation um, and then other uh, goods works and services so this would be kind of your core artistic or you know artist fees um, another one is financial support to third parties uh, we discussed third parties before so again this would be uh, anyone I guess outside of the eligible countries. So for instance, this would be where a UK cost would sit. And again, uh, this is a really kind of handy one. So this would be a 7% flat calculation of uh, indirect costs. Um, so this would be, um, you know, any kind of overheads that your organization has or running costs that are not directly related to the project, but you can claim a percentage there. Um, so within here, and again, we're going to send you this, there's a few uh, kind of useful uh, links for calculating. Um, so this is, um, this is kind of can be, can be tricky because obviously uh, costs now are, you know, especially with travel and accommodation, they're, they're rising all the time. So you really want to be, you know, kind of as, as specific not specific, what's the word, but you, you want to make sure that you're kind of future proofing here, but there's some, there's some kind of help here in terms of uh, calculating travel accommodation and subsistence ceilings, you know, from an EU perspective, um, again, some help with unit costs for travel and unit costs for personnel. Um, so again, a lot of times these are maximum, so you don't necessarily have to, like when it comes to staff, it might necessarily be that you're going for the maximum, but they're helpful in terms of a guide. Um, so again, uh, with a lump sum, uh, it's obviously, it's a budget that's based on actual costs, um, but you will need to represent them as a unit cost. And I'm sorry, this is actually an error and we'll correct it. So personnel now in previous, uh, the previous two calls uh, was based, a unit was based as a day, it's now a month. So obviously, uh, even with days, like you're looking to kind of find an average that you can represent as that unit, even if you're not paying, you know, people on a monthly basis, you're going to kind of calculate it as an average. And again, travel uh, one unit is equal to one journey. So you're kind of calculating there's going to be um, there's going to be like 50 train journeys for us over, you know, the course of three years or, or whatever it is. And you're going to find um, an average for that. Um, the thing I should say around travel now is obviously this is one area where you can address the, the climate crisis quite uh, strongly. And, uh, you know, for us, they'll have certain, um, you know, if a journey, I mean, it's, it's probably for Ireland, obviously, because of where we are, it's probably trickier, but certainly within, uh, kind of central Europe, um, journeys under a certain amount, the EU don't want to see you obviously using flights. So really kind of you can build a clear environmental rationale within travel. So that's just something to um, keep in mind. And again, just my note around uh, subcontracting. As a general comment with these applications, I would say if you're kind of going through it and you you see what might be, you know, what might be considered, you know, a hole or could 
be a flag or have a question for assessors, you know, build a kind of rationale for it. Um, you know, certainly um, that's what I would say. So everything will need to have some form of kind of justification or show that you, you've thought about it. You know, so if you're kind of flying, you might say we're flying, but we're going to, you know, work in three or four activities at the same time. So what previously might have been, you know, kind of three flights, this time we're doing it in one or, you know, that's just a, an example, but just to kind of you know, look over and see, is this going to come up as a question? And if it is, how do we address that and kind of create a rationale for it? And um, so again, just the budget form and getting started. Um, this is a mandatory annex. If you don't um, upload this, um, basically, they won't allow you to submit, which is good. It is mandatory. You will need to use Excel uh, 2010 or newer. And unfortunately, it's still the case that this is on Windows only. So this is a big issue, but at the moment, you will need to have access to, uh, to Windows. Um, Euro at the moment is the only uh, currency. So again, that can, uh, that can be you know, kind of trickier for countries outside of uh, the Eurozone, but it's just, um, it's just standardized to the Euro. Um, when you kind of download and you're working on the sheet, you'll need to save it as a macro enabled um, XLSM document, but when you're uploading it, you need to upload it as an XLS document. Um, there's only three, a lot of it are, I, I think it's probably blocked, but a lot of this will be um, automatically calculated and you can't um, you can't work on so there's three uh, there's three things that you will uh, use and I'll show you the I have some screenshots next you will kind of use the document to create a beneficiaries list to list all the partners and then you will use it to define your work packages once that's done you will have your own budget sheet that you yourself will uh, fill in so this is the other thing that's quite um, good about this one is the first tab when you download the budget is a series of instructions. And this is really helpful. So that's obviously your first, um, your first uh, port of call. Um, again, if you run into any problems, there's currently, um, we found there was a bit of a bug with one of the, the tabs and we've kind of put it in for a question. So if anything comes up, um, first get in touch with us and we can kind of look higher um, but this should be um, that should be your first instructions tab when you scroll down you'll now if you see here you'll need to uh, manually define your uh, maximum uh, European uh, contribution you're looking for so you might be looking for the full two, uh, 200,000 under small scale if you are you put in 200,000 and that's 80% uh, co-financing. Uh, that could be different, obviously, if you're not asking, but I, I would assume most people are going for the maximum co-financing rate. So once you've done that, I'm just gonna scroll down, uh, you come to uh, the beneficiaries list. Uh, we've already filled this in. It's slightly different. This is based on last year's where the country is defined by the country code. So you'll need to figure that out. So in this case, um, it would be Arts Council Ireland. Um, it asks you to set an acronym and it would be IE. Um, and as you add all of your beneficiaries, what so beneficiary one is always uh, going to be the the lead, and then the others are the the partners. You you will need to click apply changes, and you'll see it kind of go through um, a save. If you don't do that, it won't save. So you've uh, you've listed all your beneficiaries, and now you're going to come and list your uh, work packages. Work package one will always be uh, management and administration. And again, we kind of, and the last one is, is always communication and dissemination. And then you have your, your kind of two or three or maybe four, um, but again, we would kind of caution to use as few as possible. Um, you have your implementation, um, you have your implementation work packages. And again, double click and apply changes. Once you've done that, you'll see here, you can see along the bottom, um, you see the BE beneficiary one, beneficiary two, beneficiary three, it has generated um, a budget form for you to go in. And then you can see here, and again, apologies, this will now um, say months. Um, and I certainly think they don't use the term man days anymore. 
um, and then you will calculate your unit costs for staff. Um, so again, employees, th the, this is kind of editable, if that's the word here. So however you define as uh, someone's role, some people might use the term administrator or coordinator or manager. This is, this is really up to you. And then you'll see here that you will put in the number of months across the years of the project, the cost per month, and then it will start as totaling. But then you'll see here on this one, I think I might need to scroll over, but you'll see at the side, it will kind of be work package one, work package two, work package three, and your costs are divided across those. So that's us coming to the end and we'll kind of stop recording in a second and answer any questions. Or you can just go bang your head or something if it's been too much information, but basically some final thoughts. So if we look at what, um, I guess uh, people fall down on. So I think the, the first thing would be the detail. So like I was saying with the holes, like some people, you might have artists already selected or in mind and you include that. But if you don't have people in mind, you kind of create a methodology for how you're going to kind of find them or the process around that. Even things around uh, this, this could be where you can start thinking about how you're going to work in those cross cutting priorities. So if you say uh, we have uh, social inclusion or inclusion as a very strong uh, priority within all EU funding programs now, if you are thinking about an open call for artists, you need to kind of show or it should be, uh, you should be able to show that you put some thought in how you're going to reach, you know, hard to reach uh, artists or audiences or typically excluded groups or communities. This is where you can include that detail um, at all times. So there's there's your project, and then there's your project as this application. So within that, you need to be relating your project back to the award criteria at all times. Um, again, uh, what we have found over the years is that Irish projects, if you look, you know, in a really competitive context, which it is, you know, it could be a, a matter of two or three points out of 100 that you're losing where Irish projects tend to lose or projects with Irish partners would tend to kind of lose points would be across uh, communication and dissemination. So really, I would think within the process of the application, if you have a partner or if you yourself as an organization have a demonstrable track record or, or skill set within kind of communication and marketing, you know, have a specific person responsible for that in the application to take the lead on that. You know, it could be the person that's going to be in charge of that work package, but really put some thinking and time into your communication strategy. And again, focus on outcomes and deliverables. Um, as Aoife was kind of saying, I think where we fell down is we actually had about four or five different like reports for what could have actually been collated into one report. And now what we have to do because of the way the system set up is we have five separate uh, things that we now have to deliver on where we could have been one. And again, I, the budget in line with your aspirations. So this can be clear on you know, if you have a really ambitious kind of communication plan and you haven't resourced it, either in terms of kind of personnel or any costs, um, that's going to come up Wait, as, a, as a flag. Um, so I think that's us done. I'm going to stop sharing and find the record.